So during an eclipse, how do you see beyond the darkness? How do you see what's on the other side of that darkness? Just like the darkness of the moon covering the sun during an eclipse, covering up the light. So is this not telling us that Satan inspired the Egyptians to make a fake picture or a fake copy of God's plan? A counterfeit of God's plan. A plan that would lead millions of people to a salvation that was a lie. Let us connect the dots, 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 dots. Paraphrasing verse 14, Joseph Smith says, I have given you these hieroglyphic figures so that you may have an understanding of these false gods. Abraham 1 and 14. Now the anti-Mormons certainly don't want you reading this in the book of Abraham because it blows their theory apart. But it says that Pharaoh earnestly imitated the priesthood order of Noah. Therefore, he was counterfeiting it. In other words, the Egyptians did not have the gospel or the priesthood, and they led people into idolatry. Verse 27. So in a way, false religion is like counterfeit money, and nobody's dumb enough to counterfeit a $50 bill unless they've got a real $50 bill to copy and counterfeit it from. The same with the tree of life. Satan is not going to counterfeit his tree unless he can copy and counterfeit God's tree in order to fool people with the counterfeit. Suppose a $100 bill is covered up forever where you can no longer study it or see it anymore. The only way to determine what it once looked like is to study the counterfeit copy from which it was copied from. So what do you do if the book of Abraham's test is not about what you see, but what you don't see? Let us connect the dots, 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 dots. So the true benefit for the prophet showing us this mythology here is to show us how he's going to translate it backwards before the religion was corrupted back to Jehovah and Noah and Abraham and Joseph. In other words, translating a myth back into the true gospel. So the anti-Mormons launch a worldwide campaign against Joseph Smith because they say he didn't translate the Egyptian gods right. So what? That's no different than saying Joseph Smith didn't identify Bugs Bunny or Elmer Fudd correctly. This was never the point. Anti-Mormons waste hundreds of videos defending mythology over the truth of the Bible just to prove Joseph Smith a false prophet. Egyptologists care nothing about the truth. They're only interested in the myth themselves. I mean, all these anti-Mormons with their Egyptologists are sitting around studying myths that are no more real than Elmer Fudd or Bugs Bunny. So the true benefit for the prophet showing us this mythology here is to show us how he's going to translate it backwards before the religion was corrupted back to Jehovah and Noah and Abraham and Joseph. In other words, translating a myth back into the true gospel. So the question is, why would Bible prophets and modern prophets put together a mathematical code? Well because people produce documents of their own opinion. And opinions can be biased, but mathematical exactness demonstrates a higher level of understanding. Let us connect the dots, 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 dots. So we examine this Egyptian creator here. We see that he's creating a horse. He's creating animals. Well, he's not the creator of heaven and earth. He's a counterfeit. So we replace him with Jesus Christ, who did create the animals. Likewise, you see stars being gathered to a structure here, which is gathering God's people to the god Horus. Well, Horus is a false god. Replace Horus's vehicle with God's temple, which is gathering people to Christ. Here we see this figure seated on what looks to be the throne in Egypt, receiving power from on high. Well, he's a counterfeit. We know it was Joseph who received the authority in Egypt from God. And here, we have this Egyptian woman here carrying the branch. Well, she's a counterfeit, and we know that it was Rachel who brought forth the branch of the tribe of Joseph. And we know to the Egyptians this bull here represents a religious figure. It's a counterfeit. We know that Joseph was represented by the bull in the Bible. So you know the title of the book is Abraham, but you look there and you see Elmer Fudd and you say, something doesn't fit. So you replace the false figure with a figure that's corresponding with the numbers and the title of the book. The book's about Abraham and not Elmer Fudd. So some people that don't understand these facsimiles are trying to put a square peg into a round hole. And that's simply not what this is about. 
How exactly did the Lord's Gospel authority undergo counterfeit changes after the time of Noah? Well, Nimrod changed the people's sacrifices to God into political sacrifices to exalt himself in place of God. Building the great Tower of Babel was his way of robbing the people's devotion of God in order to exalt himself, all the while promising the people that they could reach heaven and become one with these false gods of astrology. Thus it was Nimrod and his wife, Sammy Ramus, who began this false religion of paganism in order to gather the people into one heart and one mind into a failed harvest of lost salvation. So when the tower fell, people scattered just as God destroyed the Tower of Babel, bringing it down. Therefore is the name of it called Babel because the Lord confounded the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Genesis 11.9 or 9.11. This includes the people that became the Egyptians. But all these groups migrated to different places in the old world, all fashioning their own versions of the pagan gods by giving them different names. This false religion from Babylon depicts a heavenly family from heaven, a father god, a mother goddess, and a sun god, representing the sun, moon, and stars of astrology. But in Egypt, the pagan family's names were changed to Osiris, Isis, and Horus. So isn't it pretty obvious that Joseph Smith wants us to perhaps see the counterfeit gospel plan so we can more clearly see the real gospel plan? Critics claim that the Rosetta Stone disproved Joseph Smith's translation was incorrect. Sean Polion matched the Egyptian hieroglyphs up here to the Greek language down here and was able to figure out the meaning of the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Consequently, he was able to match these Greek letters to the hieroglyphics up here. The thing they failed to see that even if Joseph Smith had had a Rosetta Stone, and understood it, the only thing it would have helped him translate was the names of idolatrous kings and the inner workings of a civilization built on a false priesthood, a fake religion. No prophet of God would translate a false religion. Therefore, Joseph Smith was taking us to a translation beyond the Egyptian counterfeits, back to the gospel of Adam and Noah and Abraham, a translation beyond the lies of Satan, back to God's original meaning. So Joseph Smith obviously gives us passwords and code numbers so that we might translate the false counterfeits back into the true message. So after 170 years or more of people looking at all this, why is it that nobody has ever asked the simple question? Why did Joseph Smith use simple number combinations in his translation process with these facsimiles. Well, can we answer that by things we know about today? Let's say that you're sending an encrypted number combination that will transfer five million bucks from one account to another one. And you do not want a third person getting access to that code to open that file. So you send two sets of numbers that nobody can make sense out of because they don't have the sequence to open it up or the derivative to translate the sequence into the access number. So let's say the person who receives this is the only trusted person in the whole world who knows how to translate this. And let's say for him it's pretty easy. He just adds 1 and 3 and 7 and he receives number 11. And next he adds 5, 6 and 4 and he gets the number 15. So now he's got four of the numbers he needs to open up this file right here. 11 and 15 or 1115. So now he's ready to apply the process that will unscramble this and find the next two numbers. He notices that these numbers are not in the right order. They're out of order. 137. What is missing? Well, he needs to put a 2 here to fill in between 1 and 3. So now he's got 1, 2, and 3 lined up, but he notices that 7 is out of place. It should be 1, 2, 3, 4. Where's number 4? It's clear down here at the end. So he's going to have to swap four with seven. So now he's got all the numbers in the right chronological order. One, two, three, and four adds up to 10. Five, six, and seven adds up to 18. So presto, he's now decrypted this. He now has the right combination to open up the file and grab the five million bucks. 
We will now demonstrate how Joseph Smith translated the facsimile part of the Book of Abraham by using a numbered encryption process that would be virtually impossible to reasonably debunk. Even though we can demonstrate that Joseph is referred to as a bull symbolically, and his two sons Ephraim and Manasseh are referred to as the horns of the bull, even though we can point out number five here in this hieroglyph represents Joseph, and a lot of evidence to show that, Rachel is the female element of creation that holds the branch of Joseph's posterity and pointing it into the future. And we could surmise that her son Joseph sits right behind her on the throne in Egypt, representing number seven, the seven-year famine in Egypt. But Joseph's posterity, the branch, is facing towards the future. So actually a bull and a cow give us a duality of the sexes and the procreation of the tribe of Joseph. So perhaps before the pagan myth, perhaps it was Rachel who was a type of Mother Mary, representing the virgin cow, and of course Joseph was the bull. So number five here consists of three separate parts. A female portion, holding a male branch for future posterity of Joseph's sons and a male and female cow-bull combination to represent the procreation of this future expansion. We can see that the expansion of this posterity is successful to the four quarters of the earth. And we see the symbolized bull representing the tribe of Joseph fulfilling his mission in the outer circle. So to show that this is a timeline that she is pointing to, starting with Rachel, we add five and we add six, and we find that the bowl here at the end times is number 11. And Joseph just happens to be the 11th son of Jacob. Number 11, 11, 11, 11. In other words, the biblical symbol of the bowl representing the tribe of Joseph, gathering Israel together from the four corners of the earth, pushing Israel back together to the waters of baptism and salvation. But this timeline of Joseph's tribe does not just expand into the future as Rachel is pointing. It also goes back into the past. Therefore, we go back into the past on the timeline and pick up one more number, seven. So Joseph Smith labels the outer rim of the facsimile number 18, which is exactly what you get when you add up all the numbers of the timeline. So now it's exciting in our day to find Egyptologists like Dr. Mercer, who is not a Mormon, translate these figures from the Rosetta Stone and come up with this, figure 18, I am that copulating bull without equal, verifying the timeline that we're talking about which matches the tribe of Joseph. So the increase of numbers is like a clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, added together becomes 11 o'clock, as it increases and forwards us into the future. So consistent numbers into the future are easy to follow. But what does it mean if Joseph Smith puts one of the numbers out of sequence, like number seven? Seven does not follow five. So number seven here is certainly not in the right sequence with number five and six. So before five and six, this number should be number four, not number seven. So where is number four? So to find number four, we gotta turn the whole thing upside down. And sure enough, here's the missing hieroglyph number four, clear up here out of place. We learned something from the Rosetta Stone and the Egyptologist that's pretty valuable to understand here. This is the heavenly realm up here, and down here, where we were, is the earthly realm, or the underworld. Since Joseph Smith tells us that this figure represents the expansion of time, or the wings of time, we have to ask the mathematical question, why did Joseph Smith bring this figure from the earth up to the heavenly slot here? This now measures time in heaven. We have four, we have two, and we have three, which adds up to number nine. Does number nine represent Christ's kingdom? The future is number nine, 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 nine. For does God not represent time and eternity? Is he not the eternal one? And as we see him sitting on the throne of time here, as Joseph Smith points out. But again, we have to remember these Egyptian figures are nothing but cartoons. They're just encryptions of false gods. It only makes sense if we translate these figures back 
into the true God who is Jesus Christ. So even though the Egyptologists are only interested in translating the mythology from these hieroglyphs, they still help us a great deal. They show us how this God here is looking into the past and looking into the future. And this is very evident. We see the boat here in the past. We also see the same boat here in the future, indicating this progression on the timeline up in heaven also. So this heavenly sanctuary is moving forward on the wings of time. It is pointed into the future, starting with number four, and it adds up the numbers and concludes at number nine. So Joseph Smith's translation tell us that number 11 here, who is the subject of the earthly realm, is going to have to borrow his priesthood light from number nine, which indicates God's kingdom up in heaven. How is number 11 going to borrow and connect to number nine? For Joseph tells us that figure nine through 11 essentially mean the same thing. So the only way to combine nine and 11 as one is to bring the heavenly vehicle back down to earth and restore it to the earth as it was, bringing nine and 11 together. According to scripture, God's kingdom is to split into two equal parts, becoming on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, nine here and nine here added together equals 18, which is the number of the eternal circle. In other words, Jesus is gathering his kingdom both in heaven and upon the earth on eagle's wings of time for all eternity. So Jesus is the 11th hour harvester of the earth. He is assisted by both the angels and number 11, the tribe of Joseph. Number 11 falls on the time of the harvest, the 11th hour. Therefore, number nine, the sanctuary is restored in the latter days. And Joseph is given the authority, borrowing the light from God to gather God's people into this ship of Zion, which is a type of Noah's Ark. Theories are okay for some people, but this requires a methodical order of absolute certainty where every puzzle piece must fit exactly in its correctly numbered slot. But here is the real mystery of the math that Joseph Smith has given us that we have to resolve. Number nine was originally number four. How do we reconcile that? For we still have not solved the original problem. Number seven is still out of sequence and in the wrong chronological order with this timeline. Going in reverse, it should be six, five, and this should be number four, not number seven. So the only possible way to resolve this is for number nine to become number four again and go back in time in reverse to the very beginning of the timeline. So now starting from the beginning of the timeline, we can complete the timeline. Four, five, six, added together is number 15. And to indicate we're doing it right, Joseph Smith just happens to put 15 stars on the ship, exactly 15 heavenly bodies. Does that mean that this ship of Zion is going back in the past and gathering these 15 stars or these 15 bodies and bringing them forward into the present time? So nearly 180 years, people have been asking the question why Joseph Smith placed these 15 stars or heavenly bodies on this ship figure? Are we going to answer that today? Today, multiple discoveries in ancient texts now support the Book of Abraham and verifying that Abraham was an astronomer, being tutored by Melchizedek, who actually taught astronomy related to God's revelations. So it just makes biblical sense that Joseph's dreams would correlate astronomy with the children of Abraham, now the house of Israel. Since the children of Abraham would be numbered as the stars in heaven according to God himself. And God told Abraham, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. Genesis 22, 17. Let us connect the dots, 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 dots. Once again, I have no idea what I'm doing here unless I follow the clues that Joseph Smith is giving me. What does he say about number 15? So the prophet explains that this is about this higher source of power called the grand key of the holy priesthood, which holds this higher power, which governs 15 other heavenly bodies and stars. And once again, the access code is nine through 11. So Joseph Smith obviously gives us passwords and code numbers so that we might translate the false counterfeits back into the true message. And sure enough, the verses nine through 11 give Joseph the authority over the sun, moon, and stars, representing Israel. 
But again, only Joseph in the Bible has authority over the sun, moon, and stars, which are symbolic representing Israel, the 11 brothers, his father the sun, and his mother the moon, adding up to 13. But clearly, Joseph Smith says he governs 15 heavenly bodies, not 13. How do we get the other two? Well, Joseph has two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, represented by the numbers 22 and 23 down here, adding to exactly 15. Seems the prophet is trying to make this pretty easy for us. These sun disks over these two figures' head represent suns or stars. 22 and 23 represent the two sons of Joseph. So just how obvious could this simple math be? The heavenly bodies, or the stars of Joseph's famous dream, are gathered into the Latter-day Ark. You can see the stars representing Israel gathered to the ship Zion. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. There is one boat of salvation, one church, one Christ, who makes the sons of Joseph his authorized captains, inviting all of us aboard. The biblical math takes us to a higher level, above the speculation of others, a model for all of us to see. So in past videos, we've shown that this female figure here represents the family. She's holding the family tree or the family branch. She also is one with the same numerology with all these other figures, including the scriptures. She represents one family just like the ark down here. One family of Noah got aboard the ark of salvation. Therefore, she represents the family also of the future as far as procreation. Could it be that only Rachel's offspring through Joseph would bring in the kingdom of God? Therefore, by the exact numbers of 22 and 23 given to us by Joseph Smith, we identify her prototype as Rachel, the mother of the tribe of Joseph, or the mother of Joseph, representing the bull here. Therefore, she is a prototype of the latter days. Therefore, we recognize the symbolism of Noah's Ark, which represented rebirth or baptism, people coming out of the womb, in other words, being reborn again, reconstituted, in a new life. So rather than the symbolism of a boat having eagle's wings, John gives the woman in the latter days representing Christ's church, the bride of Christ, eagle's wings, like unto a woman who's giving birth to the kingdom of God. But here's the question we have to ask. How could we have a modern ship of Zion that goes back into the past on the timeline and gathers people, and then goes forward on the timeline and gathers people? How is that possible? And then to make it more impossible, we have to justify the inconsistent numbers by taking the ship of Zion away from the confines of this earth up into the heavenly realm, where it's up in heaven gathering the dead. How is that possible? Again, the fall season of autumn consisted of the ninth month through the 11th month, or incredibly, 9-11. So in the book of Ephesians 1, 9 through 11. We learned about what 9-11 really means in this verse. It's about the last dispensation, the last days, where all things in Christ are being gathered together, both in heaven and also upon the earth at the same time. This is incredible, but this is what is happening. Because of this authority Christ has given to the tribe of Joseph in the latter days, all things are manifest, past, present, and future. Everything and time is being brought together as one. So the code number of gathering is number four on eagle's wings. And this matches number four of Exodus, which brings God's people to himself on eagle's wings. But what specific evidence do we have that this gathering on eagle's wings takes us back in time? Once again, the Egyptologists help us out with the translation from the Rosetta Stone, which tells us that these four figures here represent the four corners of the earth or the four sons of Horus in mythology. However, translating this into a Hebrew text, we would say that these four corners of the earth represent the last days, or the sons of Joseph, who become a multitude of nations in the last days. So in past videos, we've shown that this female figure here represents the family. She's holding the family tree or the family branch. She also is one with the same numerology with all these other figures including the scriptures. She represents one family just like the ark down here. One family of Noah got aboard the ark of salvation. 
Therefore, she represents the family also of the future as far as procreation. So could this mean that God's people are being gathered from the four corners of the earth in the latter days to eagle's wings also? And sure enough, God gives Joseph Smith a revelation about the gathering of these eagle's wings in the latter days through the new translation of the Bible. The Lord tells him that this is the elect being gathered from the four corners of the earth. Rachel is pointing towards the future for the gathering of Israel. Christ's sacrifice and atonement is the key to combine both the past and the future into one. Here is something very, very obvious that I don't know if anybody else has noticed, but this female figure is obviously pointing into the future. But these four figures representing the four quarters of the earth in the latter days are not. They are faced towards the past. These hieroglyphs are about posterity. This woman is holding a branch, her future family. This group here is looking to the posterity of the past. In other words, looking backwards to their fathers. So since Joseph Smith labels this number six, then there should be a scriptural passage that explains these figures looking into the past towards their posterity. And sure enough, verse six in Malachi, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else he would strike the earth with a curse, Malachi 4 and 6. So the prophet essentially gives us three timelines. We have 4 through 9, which represents the heavenly timeline. We have the earthly timeline of the underworld, which reaches 11. And then we have the circular timeline in the circle, which reaches number 18. So could these eagle's wings of time be about God's plan to take us back through time and space, and gather all of those people from the past who didn't have a chance to hear about God's gospel and accept it and bring them all forward so that they might receive salvation like unto the people in the present. But we still have a problem here with number seven because he still doesn't line up with five and six over here on the timeline. So what do we do with number seven? Do we move him or what do we do? So we brought number four back here where it should be in its number four slot. But number seven is still there. Where should we move number seven? Well, here's obviously four going backwards. This is five. This is six. Here is seven right here. This is where he goes. But now on this last timeline, everything is lined up. Four, five, six, and seven. This has to be Joseph on the throne of Egypt. Look at this, there's the bull right next to him, identifying the tribe of Joseph. This is incredible. Here's Joseph, here's the sign of the tribe of Joseph, number 11. Joseph is the 11th son of Jacob. Absolutely incredible. But here's the problem, you cannot really bring ancient Joseph back to our day as number seven in order to load everybody into this boat. That doesn't make sense that you would bring ancient Joseph back. Rather, the Lord brings a prototype of ancient Joseph, Joseph Smith, who represents a direct descendant of ancient Joseph. So Joseph Smith is number seven. He represents our modern day Noah, who's inviting the people into the modern day ark, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So we have four, five, six and seven on the timeline. Why would Joseph Smith be number seven? Your Bible as well as modern revelation give us seven dispensations. Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Peter, and number seven and the last dispensation is Joseph Smith. So this certainly seems to be a timeline of seven dispensations which reaches Joseph Smith who is number seven. From the book of Genesis we know God gave Joseph the priesthood authority and the birthright in Israel. Therefore, since he is facing the past, he also picks up four dispensations, Adam, Enoch, Noah, and Abraham. Therefore, all the dispensations in the future are also under his authority, but they are picked up in the last days through the fullness of the dispensation of Joseph Smith. So this Holy Ghost in the form of the dove figure here is all about bestowing this Abrahamic covenant on Joseph, who represents Abraham's throne and Abraham's posterity, which Joseph extends and expands into the latter days. So this perfect synchronicity and uniformity of numbers, even though we've juggled them now 30 times, and have them still come out with ancient Joseph being seven, and modern Joseph being seven, 
is amazing and stunning. So could this represent the adversary's attempt to hijack God's timeline of his seven year dispensational time in order to steal away God's plan and hide it from man in order to prevent the harvest of God's children in the 11th hour? So if Joseph Smith's mission was truly to restore the gospel, would he not want to translate this false pagan timeline of seven dispensations back into God's dispensational understanding? In other words, God's timeline should look like this. Seven dispensations all the way from Adam to Joseph Smith. So the adversary sent out his mist of darkness to not only cover God's plan and hide it from the view of the world, but disguise it into something else in order to hijack God's timeline and time schedule for this earth. In other words, place his own plan in the place of God's plan. So the prophet tells us he is adding these pagan hieroglyphs into the book of Abraham so we can learn how to see how false gods are fashioned or counterfeited. Why would God allow the adversary to disguise the truth by placing something totally false in its place? Does God say anywhere in the Bible that his gospel is going to be covered up by idol worship in order to hijack time itself away from the earth? This is fantastic to contemplate. Why would God allow this? Well, the Lord did allow this to happen in the Bible itself, starting with Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a giant idol. Yes, the Lord did allow the king of Babylon to turn the latter-day history of the whole world into a giant pagan idol for Daniel to use as a timeline of Bible history itself in order to reach the latter days. So it would seem the prophet had an important strategy. It seems that Joseph Smith is giving us the encrypted code numbers that will count the timeline down to our day and even to he himself in the Bible countdown. The timeline numbers are 11, 7, 18, and 9, 11. This priesthood covenant seems to be about preserving the family of Abraham through procreation, which explains why Joseph Smith is a descendant of Joseph in Egypt. And that seer named Joseph, whose father would also be named Joseph, would appear in the last days, 2 Nephi 3, 6 through 17. So this timeline takes us back to Rachel, who is the mother of Joseph, the polygamous wife of Jacob, who gives birth to Joseph and therefore extends and perpetuates the posterity all the way through the rest of the dispensations to Joseph Smith, who is descendant of Joseph in Egypt. And that is why she holds up the family tree here, or the branch, which points to the last days and points to number seven, Joseph Smith. The Joseph tree, as number five, was intended to reach number 18, making exactly 1805, the birth of Joseph Smith. So Rachel gave birth to the birthright son Joseph. The seven represents the seven year famine, does it not? Whereby Joseph saved Israel from certain starvation during that famine. And as we go to the last days, we have a spiritual famine, whereby Joseph Smith is saving the world from a spiritual famine. So this perfect synchronicity and uniformity of numbers, even though we've juggled them now 30 times and have them still come out with ancient Joseph being seven, and modern Joseph being seven is amazing and stunning. And like unto the sons of Joseph, Rachel is also connected to the code numbers 22 and 23 of Genesis 30. And of course, Rachel's numbers of 22 and 23 also match Joseph's sons, the branches of the family tree that run over a wall of water. Here we see her literally holding those branches of the family tree. So the family tree is like the woman coming out of the wilderness having eagle's wings, God's church or bride, giving birth to God's kingdom. Once again, Egyptologists in Facsimile 2 explain that this is a God looking both into the past and looking into the future. And amazingly, here is a branch running over a container of water, the wall of that jug, pointing to Sun 23. And we see another branch running over the right shoulder of God pointing to Sun 22. These disks here represent suns or sun disks or stars. Whereby matching Joseph Smith's description that the Father in heaven is giving his priesthood light from Kolob to these two sons of Joseph who will lead Israel in the latter days. Thereby in the dream we see that Joseph is gathering those upon the earth and in heaven also Israel in the sky, Israel upon the earth as sheaves like gathering the wheat in the latter-day harvest. 
I give you the numbers 9 through 11. 11, 11, 11. Linking us back mathematically to Joseph's number 911, whereby the sun, moon, and stars, and the heavenly bodies are being gathered to Joseph's authority, representing Israel. So if we match up facsimile 2 with parallels with the Bible, that's kind of impressive, but not impossible. But when we take it up to the next level, where facsimile 2 is matching parallels which match exact numbers, then the probabilities and the coincidences become nearly impossible. So to think that those timelines are lining up perfectly by chance is like trying to explain the odds of the same person winning the lottery ten times in a row by chance alone. Was this given to give Joseph Smith a revelation? The math itself literally debunks the possibility that these matching numbers together are a coincidence. Could it be that only Rachel's offspring through Joseph would bring in the kingdom of God? The overall purpose of Noah's Ark was to repopulate the earth again. Without male and female and the family situation, the entire plan would have fallen apart. And the code of 9-11 remains consistent in 1 Corinthians 11, where we see that the man is not without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Prophetic parallelism is not that convincing, unless it is connected together by numerology or connected codes, which is what we're doing here. Does your Bible say that Christ's priesthood power could go back in time and save people, even way back at the time of Noah, who are dead in the spirit world today, who did not know God when they lived on the earth a long time ago? In other words, Joseph Smith's timeline of salvation ends at number 18. Can the priesthood of Christ take us all the way back through time and gather all those people who did not get aboard the ship Zion in their day, all the way back to Noah. So time and time again on the past videos, we've shown these codes here, these numbers, having a biblical connection. Therefore, the number 18 on the timeline, going in reverse back to four, does that have a biblical combination whereby the high probability of this still continues to work? And sure enough, 1 Peter 3 and 18 is the only place in the entire Bible that solves the timeline problem of going back in time and saving people from the past. Verse 18 says, For Christ also has suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he went back and preached to the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. He goes back all the way to Noah and saves people. When Jesus was on the earth, he taught the gospel. He taught that no man could enter the kingdom of God unless he were baptized, born of the water and spirit. But if Jesus is up in heaven preaching to the spirits who are dead, he's not going to teach another gospel. So therefore, how is he going to baptize spirits? This is an earthly ordinance that must be done on the earth. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? 1 Corinthians 16, 29. Well, obviously, the people that lived at the time of Paul the Apostle knew that baptism could not take place without a physical body. They knew that, but people today who are Christians do not know that, even though it talks about it in their Bible. Therefore, people who are living are baptized in behalf of those who are dead, so they can receive salvation. So here's what the ark looks like today. The ship Zion that's gathering people both from heaven and earth towards God's destination. And here are the modern computerized wings of genealogy, which take us back in time to gather people long since gone. Thereby we can go back in time and gather those who are dead and seal them into the future. So the original idea of one boat or ship means that God has only one authorized way to gather his people to his church. Like the ark, there was only one prophet God called to build and navigate that ship, and that was Noah. The only way to salvation was by following that one priesthood leadership given by Christ. You see the stars representing Israel in the boat. That means today it is still that same pattern. No one can claim to give commandments or lead people outside that one ship of Zion or that one authorized church structure. The only way to obtain your eagle's wings to rise to exaltation 
is by obeying those church ordinances. If somebody comes along with a counterfeit boat or another way, you automatically know that you're in danger of boarding the wrong ship. If you honestly look at Satan's overall message in public protests and on the anti-Mormon internet sites, it's all designed to prevent you from getting aboard the one true ark. Bible scriptures are embryos of time. It will hatch in the future. You'll find out in a few thousand years.